Good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn. Ben and I are delighted to welcome you to worship this morning as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. From a safe social distance, it is the hope that as you enjoyed the visual art in the prelude slideshow, that you were able to imagine children waving palm branches, either present in our sanctuary or many years ago ahead to worship you today and this week and we journey with your son in this week of remembrance and hope help us to understand you and your love for the world more clearly amen please join in singing number 58 prepare the way of the lord Sorry, I'm having some technical issues. You're, you don't have your Wi-Fi off? Yeah, yeah. I have the letter to Can you turn your Wi-Fi off? Go tell Dad that I can hear him. A great crowd who had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. As we are called into worship today, it is sobering to remember that when God appeared on earth in the person of Jesus, most of the world did not recognize him and therefore did not worship him. The crowd on that long ago day imagined a different sort of king walking into Jerusalem. But we can imagine the king that he truly is, walking beside his children in times of trial and times of hope, leading us to salvation. Thank you. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us find a way to pass the peace of Christ to each other, even from a distance and especially to the people in your home. Let us confess our sins together and receive forgiveness. Loving God, you rode a donkey and came in peace, humbled yourself, and gave mercy on us, son of David, savior of our lives. Can you read this? Help us to lay at your feet all that we have and all that we are, trusting you to forgive what is sinful, to heal what is broken, to welcome our praises, and to receive us as your own. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Please join in this tangible reminder. You are disciples of Jesus Christ. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Our song of assurance is number 332, As the Deer Pants for the Water. pants for the Thank you. 
eternal God, whose word silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice but your own. Speak to us through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Amen. The scripture reading today is from John 12, verses 20 to 37. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, An angel has spoken to, to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of light. After Jesus had said this, he departed and hid from them. Although he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. This is the word of the Lord. Fellow disciples of Jesus Christ, there are no parades today, no great crowds like John describes them back in verse 9, no processionals of children waving palm branches in packed churches. If there were, if we could gather together today and cry out, Hosanna to the Son of David, like we usually do, I wonder what we might mean this year on this Palm Sunday. Hosanna means save us. Save us, Son of David. Save us, Jesus. On some Palm Sundays, on ordinary Palm Sundays, we like to point out that those crowds who welcomed Jesus to Jerusalem, <clears throat> they didn't understand what they really needed from Jesus. They wanted to be saved from Roman oppression. They were cheering for Jesus because they had seen him raise Lazarus back to life after Lazarus had been dead for four whole days. They were focused on what Jesus could do for their present problem. They were hoping for freedom from Caesar. Now we know they were hoping for the wrong things. We know that Jesus had much bigger things in mind. And yet I wonder, 
if Jesus rode into KW today, if we cried out, Hosanna, save us, what might we want Jesus to save us from? From all the powers of hell? Or from the coronavirus? Maybe that's not a fair question because can't he save us from both? From the eternal problems of a world going to hell and from the temporary problems of a pandemic? Why not ask for both? Just because they didn't doesn't mean that we can't. John's description of that crowd does not give us much detail, just that it was the great crowd that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They wanted to see Jesus and they wanted to see Lazarus. And John tells us that neither they nor the disciples understood anything about what was happening. The whole story only takes four verses in John, verses 12 to 15. We didn't even read them this morning because John seems much more interested in what happens next, described in the verses we did read. He says that some Greeks who were in town for the festival wanted a personal audience with Jesus, but it doesn't look like they got it. When, when Philip and Andrew told Jesus about them, Jesus basically said, mm, too late. It's too late for that. If they wanted to see Jesus up close and personal, they were going to have to come back on Friday. For the people in first century Palestine, the chance to see Jesus as rabbi, teacher, and miracle worker was over. The time had come, the hour had come for Jesus to die. Or as John put it, for the Son of Man to be glorified, for Jesus to be lifted up. Now that, that word that means lifted up has the feeling of, of lifting a coach on the shoulders of a team after winning an important game. But Jesus knows when he is lifted up, it's going to be on a cross. Palm Sunday was not a happy day for him. Now, as I said, John doesn't give us much detail, not as much as the other Gospels. We don't hear from John, for example, about Jesus weeping for Jerusalem. The only weeping we see Jesus doing in John is one chapter back when he weeps at the grave of Lazarus, right, right before he brings him back to life, which is kind of mysterious. I mean, why weep when he's about to bring Lazarus back? What was there for him to cry about? What John tells us about Jesus on Palm Sunday is not that he weeps, but that his soul is troubled. He doesn't ask the Father to save him from this hour because he knows that that is why he came to live among humans in the first place. But his soul is troubled about... On Palm Sunday, do we see Jesus' humanness? Dreading the horrific death that lies ahead of him? Do we see his human fragility, knowing that his physical body has limits? That in less than a week, his body will sag, folding over on itself as he hung on a cross until his lungs are crushed and he suffocates? Is that? why Jesus' soul is troubled? Or, or was it a spiritual troubling, knowing that, that he would be on that cross alone, knowing that for a while, at least, even his father would forsake him? Or was his soul troubled by the almost inconceivable reality that, that this was necessary in the first place? By, by the mystery of human beings rejecting the God who created them and choosing death instead of life? Was Jesus lamenting like the psalmists did, like we are doing now as the world is in turmoil and, and we are helpless and we're looking for answers, but there are none and not, not yet at least there is no explanation really for how we got to where we are or how we're going to get out? Is Palm Sunday Jesus feeling something like we feel on this Palm Sunday, frightened and confused? 
looking for explanations, answers. N.T. Wright wrote a little thing this week that has been widely circulated on the internet in which he, he defines lament as, as the thing that happens when people ask why and don't get an answer. Don't get an answer. It, it's where we get to when we move beyond our self-centered worry about our sins and failings and look more broadly at the suffering of the world. And the mystery of the biblical story, Wright writes, is that God also laments. Some Christians, he says, like to think that God is above all that, knowing everything, in charge of everything, calm and unaffected by the troubles of this world. But that is not the picture we get in the Bible. And the God we meet in scripture is a God grieved to his heart over the violent wickedness of his human creatures. He was devastated when his own bride, the people of Israel, turned away from him. And, and when God came back to the people uh, of Israel in person, he wept at the tomb of his friend. John says he was greatly disturbed in spirit, even though he knew he was going to bring him back. Maybe that's because he knew that, that even that would not convince the Jews. Some would believe something because of that final miracle, but, but many, it says in verse 37, did not. And that seems like a good reason to be troubled and to lament. When I look at Palm Sunday Jesus this year, I see him weeping. I see him weeping by bedsides all over the world. Bedsides of COVID patients whose lungs are failing them. Patients struggling, gasping for breath as Jesus did on the cross. I see him weeping, lamenting for all that brought us to this place. Even though he knows that death is not the end even though he knows who he will raise from death at the last day. I see, I see his human understanding of human suffering intimately tied to his divine glory. I see that his glory is displayed most clearly in his suffering. I remember that most of us will not see Jesus in all his glory without our own death. And that not one of us will see Jesus in his glory without his death. And I see that even though Jesus knows exactly how glorious glory is and how it is greater than any suffering that any of us might endure here on earth, Jesus' soul was still troubled. And Jesus wept. So when we cry out, Hosanna to the son of David on this Palm Sunday, it is okay to mean both save our souls and save our bodies. It is okay to mean give us eternal life and, and give us more of this life too. Because Jesus understands that. He's not bound by the, the limits of physical human bodies or even physical human time, but he knows them. In this chapter of John, we see him moving back and forth between physical time and God time. There are, there are Greek words for these times, of course. Kronos time is, is physical, linear time, and, and, and Kairos time is God's time, eternal time. The, the one day to, to us, to him, is like a thousand years to us and vice versa. The, the Jesus came when time had fully come time. The my hour has come time. In the church, we have yet another kind of time. We have liturgical time, the, the time that brings us from Advent to Pentecost each year, the, the, the kind that leads us from, from, uh, to celebrate Palm Sunday each year. The kind that brings us through the four dark weeks of Advent and the six dark weeks of Lent each year. So here we are at the end of Lent. 
at the end of the lentiest Lent most of us have ever experienced. We have been asked to give up more for Lent than we ever imagined way back on Ash Wednesday in February, a lifetime ago, in another strange kind of time. Lent is, is meant to be a time of reflecting, a, a six weeks time of, of waiting once again for Jesus to die and to rise and for the world to be saved. This particular year, Easter will come as it always does and we will still be waiting, waiting to be saved from dying, from death. So maybe this would be a year to skip all that liturgical stuff. After all, we don't really know when Palm Sunday or Easter actually happened anyway. Maybe I should just preach on passages particularly comforting for a pandemic. I've seen some churches that say they're going to, they're going to wait to celebrate Easter until this is all over, whenever that might be. But I think they're making a big mistake. I think we need to keep finding ways to live in, in Kronos and Kairos and liturgical time all at the same time. I think it's the only way for us to live in this unusual time. Now, maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Let me try to help you make some sense of it. I've been reading a, a popular book that I've meant to read for a long time, but finally got around to reading this past week. It's a book called Liturgy of the Ordinary, and it has a chapter called Sitting in Traffic liturgical time, and an unhurried God. The author writes about the spiritual blessings of being stuck in traffic, against her will, being forced to wait, against her will. She writes, for the good of my own soul, I need to feel what it's like to wait, to let the moments march past. And here I am, plunged into an ancient spiritual practice in the middle of the freeway, forced against my will to practice waiting. Because the reality is that we do not control time. Every day we wait. We wait for help. We wait for healing. We wait for the days to come. We wait for rescue and redemption. And we are all waiting to die. And as we see in John 12, not even Jesus looked forward to that. But as Christians, we wait for something else, too. We wait for Jesus to return. We wait for the resurrection of our bodies. Christians are people who wait. We live in the already and the not yet. Christ has come, and he will come again, and we live between those times. We wait. So, so back to this book, Trish Warren writes, here in traffic, when I'm stuck in the in-between, neither where I've come from nor yet where I'm going, I inhabit the liturgical rhythm I practice year after year, waiting and hoping. My present reality is fundamentally, fundamentally oriented toward what is to come. I am on the way. Yet, our assurance is rooted in the past, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, in his promises and his resurrection. So she wondered as she sat in traffic, what if we forget about the big picture, the big, the big chronos, the, the big time, the, the kairos time? What if, we, what if we just live in the chronos time? What if we came to believe that this grimy highway is all there is. What if we all left our cars and set up cots? Someone pulls out a, a, a grill from a truck bed and starts a barbecue. Maybe we start up a poker game. We aren't going anywhere. Eventually we say, there is nowhere else to go. And we make ourselves as comfortable as we can. She writes, people begin to hoard food. Fights break out. People siphon gas and squabble over jumper cables to keep the air conditioning going. We each stake out our own territory and try to eke out an existence on the 401. 
believing that these gasoline fumes and concrete pillars are all there is. This is the way the world has been and always will be. That would be a disaster. Out of touch with the larger reality, we would have lost our purpose. We would have forgotten that there are better ways to live. The liturgical calendar reminds us that we are people who live by a different story than just the one on the news. And, and, and we don't just live by a story, <clears throat> we live in a story. We live in the truth that however slowly or quickly we may be traveling, we are going somewhere. Or more accurately, somewhere, someone is drawing near to us. Redemption is crashing in our little stretch of the universe, bit by bit, day by day, mile by mile. We have hope because as we will read this coming week in John chapter 14, Jesus has promised. He has promised he is preparing a place for us. Now maybe N.T. Wright is right, that what we need right now is to discover the biblical tradition of lament while we wait for the story to come to its conclusion. To lament, rather than try to explain what's happening or why. John tells us the disciples themselves were not able to explain anything until after Palm Sunday. After the darkness had passed. And it might help us to remember that God laments too, wondering why we behave the way we do, but saving us anyway. Today we picture a troubled Jesus on a little donkey fumbling their way together into Jerusalem. And in our minds, we wave branches at him troubled also by his impending death. But maybe even more aware that many more humans will die in the weeks and months ahead from a little virus. We are a sober people this Palm Sunday. A people caught so obviously between the already and the not yet. So we cry Hosanna with special fervor. Save us, son of David. Save us from our enemies. Save us from evil. Save us from death. We can sing it loud with praise and with lament and with faith all at the same time. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, for Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of Heaven, our King. Amen.
I found this little thing that Max Lucado wrote. He says, I thought about the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus himself was afraid. It struck me that Jesus faced his own fear by going to pray and by taking people to pray with him. That is a picture, he says, of a healthy church. The church is the modern day version of the Garden of Gethsemane. A healthy church is a place where I can go and cry out in fear. It is a place where I can find a community of people to whom I can be honest and say, please pray with me about this fear. The church becomes the place where fears go to die. So now we're gonna do what we did last week. Um, uh, Anne is going to play in the background for a few minutes while we share our prayers using the chat feature, uh, probably on the bottom of your screen. I remind you that this service is being uh, recorded, but the chat feature is not. Uh, we, do, we do capture them and pass them to the pastoral elders and haven't quite decided exactly what to do with them all yet, but um, let us join together in this time of prayer, which we will conclude as usual with the Lord's Prayer.
Let's close together <clears throat> with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts <clears throat> as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering this morning is for Friendship Ministries. I encourage you again to uh, check out the link to donate directly to Friendship. And I invite uh, Grace to offer the deacon's prayer. Lord, as we offer our gifts to you this Palm Sunday, we're reminded that you walked to Jerusalem to offer yourself as a gift. Many of our gifts this week are not just money offering for friendship ministries, but we have given prayer, we have given time and energy to other organizations to help us through this time. Um, many members of our church have given their time to Ray of Hope as well. But Friendship Ministries, oh Lord, um, have switched to create an online ministry and need our finances, they need our help. Um, Lord, we know how hard organizations are having trouble fundraising and we pray that whatever offerings we gave this week or today that they are acceptable to you. Um, it is not easy in, in this time to come up with the money for some of us, but we can all pray and we ask that you accept our prayers and offerings and that Friendship Ministries will use these funds to glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Are you going to say anything about next week's offering, Grace? Oh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> forgot. <laughs> uh, next, next week's offering is for um, Resonant Global Missions. They are having a special um, offering to allow them to double up to the end of April anything that you give. Uh, they... I didn't write anything down about them. Sorry. Um, can you sound more about it? Mickey? Well, we know resonate, right? Home missions, uh, world missions combined, the work that they yeah. do. We always collect for them on, on Easter Sunday. Yeah. So. There, there is a $125,000 matching program till the end of April for them. So we request them. Um, we've, as deacons, we've been looking at um, other missional groups that are having um, a hard time fundraising and we ask that you do what you can in this time it's not easy so uh, we ask that you um, pray and donate what you can to the uh, resident global missions Great. now we close with these words we are people on a journey following where the master walks we are people on a journey in the shadow of the cross. What compels? The face of Jesus. Who protects? Our faithful guide. He who treads the road of service, Christ the Lord, the crucified. Let's sing together. We are people on a journey.
before I pronounce the benediction, I want to tell you, I guess I'm not reminding you, I'm telling you, um, Friday is Good Friday, and we will be holding a service much like this on Zoom Friday morning at 1030, as we would in our sanctuary, and we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as we would if we were in the sanctuary. We have not made decisions about exactly what we're going to do about the sacrament. There is a lot of discussion going on um, among church churches, church leaders of denominations. Um, one of the things that uh, John Whitfleet said was that we should stop asking what we can get away with, what's right, what's wrong, what the church order says, and to start asking what can we do that is the most meaningful? How can we celebrate the sacrament in, in a way that is meaningful? And that's what we are aiming to do on, on Good Friday. And then, uh, oh, you'll have to obviously um, come prepared with your own, your own bread and your own um, fruit of the grape uh, in order to celebrate in your own homes. And now I bring you God's blessings. May the Lord go before you to guide you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to support you, beside you to befriend you. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each one of you. Be not afraid. Stay home in peace. Amen. <laughs>